So we will begin by giving the floor to Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, who is a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania and who will be discussing black lives in Eurasia, African, Afro-Russian and Afro-Ukrainian responses to the US protest and racism. Then we will hear from Vyacheslav Morozov from the University of Tartu in Estonia, professor of EU-Russia studies, who will be discussing Mourning the Capitalist Dream, Russian Intellectuals and the US Protest. And then we will have Volodymyr uh, Dubovic, Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations at uh, Odessa Mechnikov National University in Ukraine, discussing the view from Ukraine on the US protest. So welcome everybody and let's begin. Kimberly, I give you the floor. So as can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. So um as introduced, I'm going to be discussing what does Black Lives Matter look like in Eurasia? And this comes from my own experience working in Ukraine, but also thinking about what is Black experience outside of, you know, North America or outside of Western Europe, where we generally think of people of having dark skin being in these places. And what's been interesting is that in Russia, there hasn't been a real, you know, amount of protest and solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protest in the United States. But there have been an influx of interviews and articles discussing the Black experience in Russia. And I think that's just as important as having protests as we finally start having these conversations of racism and experiences with racism in Russia. Um, so, so the BBC Russia service, Sloan.ru, um, also some Instagram posts um, I've seen online, but also Twitter conversations where Afro-Russians and African residents of Russia have started discussing their experiences with racism. And these are just some of the, the things that I've seen across the board in terms of discussing the issues with racism, particularly people who are Afro-Russian. So usually they will have a Russian mother and an African father, and usually their fathers were students who came to Russia and studied and they stayed and met their mothers or their fathers had to go back to their country of origin. So what we have here are a lot of biracial individuals who are Russian who are having to deal with the fact that they are not treated as Russians. They are not seen as part of the Russian nation because they don't, they don't have the traditional look of a Slav. And so some of these are some of the issues they discuss. They talk about being laughed at. They talk about being stared at all the time. They talk about um, having issues with being able to get taxis. One of the most recent incidents was in Bryansk in June where an African student was denied you know, a ride in a taxi. And when he asked the taxi driver, are you racist? The taxi driver says, Kanish Nada, of course I'm racist. You know, and he ends up being fired by Yandex. And there was actually a, a Twitter firestorm about the firing of the taxi driver and that the taxi driver should have been able to say, yes, I'm racist. I don't want you in my car and still be able to drive for Yandex. So we kind of see some of these issues there. Another thing that's been interesting is the discussion of the difficulty in finding apartments, being able to rent an apartment or buy an apartment, but also finding employment. Um, has been something that Afro-Russians have discussed and African residents have discussed. They also talk about racial slurs besides the N-word, but also being called a monkey or being called Negroes, which in, you know, in parlance in North America, that term is, you know, outdated and we use African-American, a person of color. But in Russia, we still have that issue of, do you call someone a Negro or Chorni or Tsimnohozhye? And we have these different contexts and these different connotations for these words that aren't similar to the North American context. But one of the most striking things and examples that we constantly see is the cruelty of children and their parents. So when you see these Afro-Russians discussing what was so difficult about being Black in Russia, they talk about their childhoods. They talk about being ostracized or parents not allowing other children to play with them. Um, one young man, he is Afro-Russian, and when he was in elementary school, no one wanted to play with him, and he went to like a, a meeting of parents and teachers, and they told his mother, well, you decided to give birth to that. And that was her justification for not being his friend. And so across the board, we see them talking about how racism really bothered me as a child, but now I've turned myself off from that. 
And while we can talk about the power of resilience, what this really is saying is I've turned my feelings off to being hurt. So now we see this interesting conversation of people who are Afro-Russian, but also African residents of Russia who've been there for a long period of time who talk about the fact that I don't let staring bother me. I don't let being called names bother me. As long as I'm physically safe, then I'm okay, right? And so that's something we also should kind of examine because I felt the same way in Ukraine. You can take pictures of me, you can stare at me. As long as I'm physically safe, I'm okay. But what does that do to the psyche of a person who's accepted various forms of racism as long as physical violence isn't included in that? Um, another interesting aspect of what I've seen in terms of in the BBC interviews, they ask, well, why do you think there aren't any Black Lives Matter protests in Russia? And I was actually surprised because a lot of them said, well, we don't have a legacy of slavery in Russia. Like, so these are Afro-Russians and African residents who say, well, Russia doesn't have a legacy of slavery, so there isn't really institutional racism. Or they say there are not that many Black people here in general, so we don't have a, a, a movement. Or, you know, we don't have any leaders or organizations. But the most interesting two points I've seen are, well, protests aren't allowed in Russia in general, so of course we're not going to protest. And then you also have, and a few of the Black residents have said, well, Russian police are different. And they say, well, a Russian police officer couldn't, you know, choke someone to death. He would be held responsible. And I found that as a really interesting response to this general idea that Russian police brutalize everyone in Russia. As we've seen with the Russian Lives Matter movement, they've talked about that. But Afro-Russians have kind of seen the police as not necessarily a positive force, but they aren't the main pushers of racism that they've experienced. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this is there's a lot of solidarity with Central Asian migrants and residents, in, especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Most of the Afro-Russian Afro and African residents said, oh, we have racism, but I really feel bad for Central Asians or people from the former Soviet states. And one of the uh, interviewees, she said, if we really want to have a movement, it needs to start with the Central Asians because they are, there are so many of them. But also, if you look at the academic literature, especially Jeff Sahadeo's work, he talks about how Black was used against Central Asians. And so after the Soviet period, when we start seeing Black being used in general towards Africans, but also Central Asians. Um, two of the most, I guess, well-known instances of Afro-Russians and what they're dealing with is Maria Tankara, who's a 20-something um, Afro-Ukrainian who lives in St. Petersburg, who is investigated for extremism for talking about her lived experience with racism in Russia. But also Anna Polyansky, who's a presenter, she said um, recently in a blog post, she said, we have racism in Russia, we have racism in America, but at least in America, they admit that racism exists, right? And so we have these issues with the response to Afro-Russians and Africans discussing racism in Russia, where the, the response is, well, it's not the same. We don't have racism here. This is xenophobia. But at the heart of that context, well, this isn't racism, this is xenophobia. You're presuming that a Black person cannot also be Russian, right? You're still defining them as outside of the nation. I mean, briefly, I'll talk about Ukraine. Um, Ukraine has actually had some very small protests in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, one of the most uh, interesting is a, a single person protest in Zaporozhye, Konstantin Andreev, who is Ukrainian, he is not Afro-Ukrainian, but he was having a protest to support his Afro-Ukrainian you know, Afro African friends in Ukraine who had had experiences with racism and not being served at bars and not being able to get apartments. And a lot of people, he said, came up to him and said, well, why are you so focused on Black people? We have our own issues in Ukraine. Right. And as I've said before, it's this idea that we have to deal with racism and treat and you know triage. We have to deal with Russia first. We have to deal with women's rights first, and then we'll get to racism instead of seeing all these issues as interconnected. Um, and another protest that happened was in Ternopil. So there's a group of African students who protested in solidarity of Black Lives Matter, but also to talk about their what they faced with racism in Ukraine. And um, a lot of people were very angry at them, including uh, Volodymyr Bobko, the deputy, one of the deputies of the regional council in Ternopil, who called for them to be rounded up and deported. And he said, either this is them getting ready to try to, you know, rob and loot, or this is foreign intrigue, right? And outside forces getting them to do this. And 
it kind of broke my heart because at the end of the day, we still see these, you know, more alt-right interpretations of the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States heavily influencing how Eurasians are understanding what's going on when protests happen inside the country. Um, finally, I think something that's been really interesting is when we look at the greater post-Soviet, but also post-communist space, we actually see protests throughout the Balkans in Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro. There have been protests of solidarity, solidarity in Poland with discussions of the word Merzen and what does that mean for a person of color. So I don't think this is an issue of Russia is behind or Ukraine is behind. This is an issue of these spaces having to deal with and grapple with. We have these people who are people of color and how do we deal with them, but also how do we understand them and their positions within our multicultural, multinational state? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Great presentation. And now we'd like to give the floor to Vyacheslav. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Marlene. Um, um, let me start my uh, uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. All right. So um, um, I will actually continue uh, more or less uh, on uh, where uh, Kimberly also already started uh, discussing uh, Russian reaction to Black Lives Matter and in general to, to the protests in the US, the recent protests in the US. Uh, but um, I'm mostly interested in the um, um, liberal reaction in, in kind of the centrists, uh, even pro-Western centrists who uh, sometimes are also quite uh, against the protests, and that's that's a surprising reaction, you might think, in a certain respect. But still, I, I, that, that, that's something that I'm trying to explain. But let let me first um, give you a general idea that, of course, uh, I would say that in general, people in Russia are shocked by the movement, and of course, we have to take into account that it's presented in a certain way by the media, especially state-run TV. They mostly tend to see the protests as violent, violent riots, looting and everything. And by the way, I deliberately picked the pictures from the Russian media uh, illustrating um, articles um, about the protests. Uh, um, uh, they have, um, uh, in general, there is, there is very little compassion or sympathy towards the protesters. It, at best, they're seen as a, as a problem that needs to, 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 to be dealt with somehow. And of course, there is a wide spectrum of opinions. Some of them are expected uh, on the right and on the left. Uh, that there is nothing surprising. But um, and and also the Kremlin, of course, the, the pro-Kremlin media that presents an image of total chaos and helpless law enforcement and and things like that. But that's a traditional picture of the West as it figures in in, in pro-Kremlin media. But and and a lot of conspiracy theories and all of that. But uh, what is the most interesting, of course, is the, uh, the, how alarmed uh, the liberal center is. And um, if you look at the, uh, at the, liberal, uh, at the liberals uh, uh, or Russian liberals and their, their interpretation of the protests, then you would see that um, they emphasize, of course, very much uh, violence and lawlessness and destruction of property, looting and so on. Um, they uh, are very much concerned about uh, those alleged demands for uh, for apology from people who have, who have allegedly nothing to do with oppressing African Americans and of course policemen is a special topic here. Um, uh, there is a lot of talk about affirmative action being unfair and uh, encouraging incompetence and so on. Uh, uh, again, uh, they say that African Americans mostly have themselves to blame for poverty and discrimination and so on. Uh, one very important point is about freedom of speech, which is allegedly under attack. Um, and and, and um, uh, also the monuments are very important here. Uh, this, this talk about the legacy, how, how, it's, vand uh, how uh, it's vandalized and so on. Um, uh, to highlight what I find particularly interesting are uh, parallels with Bolshevism and of course the scale of disruption is uh, exaggerated in, in this case as in many others. Uh, then there is an argument that racism in, in the US does exist but the problem is being blown out of proportion. Um, uh, they blame mostly kind of left-wing intellectuals in coalition with recent immigrants and this is obviously has parallels with the Russian situation as well. Um, and um, 
Uh, one point that is very much emphasized is that the West has no immunity against dangerous extremist ideas. And most recently, were the, there were these parallels with Belarus that I find particularly interesting. And this is actually part of um, uh, something that points towards the explanation that I'm going to offer in a moment. And that is uh, that you have cultured, civilized, peaceful protest in Belarus. Look at those people who even took their to, to, to take, take, take off their shoes before uh, climbing a bench in the park to protest and uh, all this looting in the US and violence and so on. Uh, obviously, you know, we, 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 we're talking about civilization. Here. And there are several explanations uh, for this reaction. Some of them are highlighted in the recent memo uh, co-authored uh, by Peter Rutland from Ponars and Enrique Zantzev. Um, uh, there is obviously a lack of knowledge about U.S. history. Uh, there, is, uh, th there is also a tendency to see Russians as victims of history. Um, and uh, uh, as, as in many such discourses, there is a, an exclusive claim to being uh, a victim. Uh, the official promotion of Russianness, uh, which has actually been going on for a number of years already, but especially in connection with the constitutional reform and the introduction of this formula. It's actually an old, an old formula, but it's the first time it, it has made it into the into the legislation, especially the constitution, the state form of people and so on. But actually what, what, what I think these explanations miss is, and this is my key argument, that there is a crucial class dimension in this story and it's actually being covered or concealed by uh, uh, this argument about culture and civilization. And uh, it's very much about the privileged cosmopolitan middle class or even upper middle class, uh, which is suspicious uh, of attacks on the privilege as such, not just, um, not just uh, simply uh, looting or uh, disruption and so on. Uh, the most revealing example uh, in this respect is, of course, Ksenia Sobchak's uh, video where, in which she compares um, uh, two films, two recent films, Joker and Parasite, and um, basically she uh, blames uh, this kind of art and this, this kind of uh, left-wing discourse for um, uh, inciting the riots and uh, uh, she's very adamant to emphasize the marginality, the deviation behind this, uh, this image of uh, the main protagonist in Joker. And um, uh, she says that Soviet slogans have come to the US and uh, this is a very revealing phrase, I think, that figures in the video. Why the killing of a black man has to end with the looting of Louis Vuitton and Prada shops. So Louis Vuitton and, and, and um, Prada are here symbols of, I don't know, civilization and something that has to be cherished and valued. And, um, and um, this, uh, th this, this crowd is unruly and obviously has to be condemned for, for the looting. Um, and I think there is a certain historical background to this. Um, obviously, there is uh, uh, anti-racism in general is associated with uh, Soviet authoritarianism and Soviet propaganda. And this is why it's so much opposed to uh, freedom of speech, because it's seen as censorship. Um, and also, there is allergy to anything socialist or anything left-wing, which is still very strong among Russian liberals, especially of an older generation, but not exclusively of the older generation. Uh, this, this very interesting argument that you, you, you see not just in this discussion, but uh, also in other um, uh, debates, uh, that Russia is in a way more mature due to the Soviet trauma. That uh, having survived uh, socialism made Russia, uh, along maybe with other post-Soviet space, uh, kind of uh, more experienced and therefore uh, uh, the Russians can actually appreciate the danger of authoritarianism and uh, attacks against the, the freedom of speech and left-wing extremism and so on. Um, there is also this loss of imaginary West, which you can also see in um, so Chuck's message um, that uh, there is an this idealized image of the US as a, as a kind of a guiding light for, for many Russian liberals. And when you hear about deep structural problems, that it creates a certain cognitive dissonance. 
Um, but it's also um, actually it also has to do with the cult of personal success, which dates back to the perestroika time. And it's very if you analyze the late Soviet popular culture, you see it there that it's very individualist, very kind of oriented towards uh, personal success, individualist outlook, and um, it can be even interpreted as a form of new 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 liberal critique of socialism. And um, it uh, kind of returns uh, to us in this in this current debate. But I also would say that uh, it, it, it very much um, uh, it, it has very much to, 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 to much to do with um, anti-populism of uh, post-socialist intelligentsia, which has been highlighted by people like Rosen Jagala, um, uh, that um, uh, there was actually um, a struggle in the elites for status in uh, already in the late Soviet period, uh, but eventually it kind of spilled over into. Uh, this very elitist outlook, which to some extent has to do with the uh, growing class inequality, inequality in late Soviet society. But on the other hand, um, it, um, it, it definitely is connected with Russia's and the Soviet Union's uh, kind of peripheral position in uh, global capitalism. So in a way, this emphasis on whiteness that you see there in the Russian debate, uh, I call it subaltern whiteness, that, uh, that it's actually about being um, kind of um, envious also about Western prosperity and eager to occupy a decent place in the global hierarchy. And therefore, it's, uh, it, it's, it's about asserting your own white privileged status as opposed to uh, the protesters, for instance, or in general, the uncivilized world and, uh, and, and all those developing countries and so on, which allegedly are kind of behind Russia and Russia is not appreciated as such. And um, um, it, it, it's actually this argument fits into a whole uh, system of arguments, which I probably have no time to fully review at the moment, but um, there are multiple layers of argumentation which have culture at the surface, but actually they're about class. It's about Homo Sovieticus as people who allegedly are civilizationally incompetent and incap incapable of living in a normal capitalist world. It's also about negative selection under Stalin. The best were killed, murdered, uh, the, uh, the uh, opportunists survived, and the current generation of Russians is uh, our descendants of opportunists. Uh, it's about peasants who contam allegedly contaminated uh, urban culture, the legacy of serfdom, and so on. But generally, it's... Um, it's about the intellectuals asserting their privilege and uh, claiming a status of, you know, kind of leaders in the society, and um, um, uh, it's um, it, it also it's it's also connected with the uh, uh, discrimination of guest workers, uh, because once again the reason one of the key reasons why guest workers have so little sympathy, uh, Kimberly mentioned that um, in the in, in in the Russian society is that it's also about class. They are considered as uh, underachievers in a way, as people who do not deserve to be treated equally, and that's that 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 is also a huge problem. So there are this, these multiple legacies which I think are important for the understanding of the Russian reaction, and we really need to pay attention to class inequality as a very important aspect of this problem. Uh, something that is not really discussed and is not br brought to the surface, brought brought to the fore in this debate, but. Um, it's a really important dimension. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much, Vyacheslav, for this great presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to Volodymyr. See if I can unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marlene. And uh, it's, it's good to be here. You know, it's good that Potash is working despite all the difficulties and troubled times. Uh, it's already a second panel, uh, and that's wonderful. And uh, uh, months ago, I uh, already took part in the owners led uh, panel on COVID issues in Ukraine. Uh, COVID is still around, unfortunately, in our countries, including Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, we are having other issues uh, to discuss, including the one that we discussed today. <clears throat> I apologize in advance for my voice. I'm struggling with a seasonal allergy, you know, this pollen, ragweed really tortures me, so my voice might not come up naturally to you. 
Uh, uh, several things been said already. Uh, I have this privilege of being the, the third speaker and uh, obviously great uh, minds, uh, you know, think al alike, as they say, and uh, some of my colleagues have been said, said, said already the things that I was planning to uh, say as well. Let me first uh, uh, repeat what uh, Slava said already is that in my view, the, a lot of people here don't uh, come up with a lot of sympathy or let alone support for, for the Black Lives Matter movement among other things, uh, is that they misinterpret a lot of things and misread a lot of things that are happening in, in America. Uh, Slava said already there is a phenomenon of riots, but uh, people uh, tend to conflate uh, riots with protests, and there's no distinction. I mean, I mean, a lot of people just uh, fail deliberately or honestly to understand that there are protests, then there are riots, then there are looting, and there are three different things, all right? And three different groups of people supposedly take part in those three. But people don't 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 care, you know. And the media focuses on violence, and I I usually don't tend to blame, uh, uh, you know, media. But in this case, it's uh, there is definitely a case of sensationalization of events, and of course they 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 they, they picture, they show the, the the fire, the looting, and they don't they they downplay the, the the truth about peaceful protests. I think it was today that the Washington Post actually published an interesting article about a project, a study into the protests, uh, which uh, proved that 93% of the protests were entirely, you know, completely peaceful. And so only 7% of those protests that took place actually had some violent element in them. And it doesn't mean that we should just disregard or not care about the, the, the violent uh, element, uh, as, we have, as we've seen in the recent days, you know, in Kenosha and Portland and elsewhere, uh, they are a reason for us to be concerned, but at the same time, uh, that's not a picture that you usually get from the media. If you just look through the articles, people will tend to think here in post space for sure that most uh, you know, protests are violent. Second thing, I think it's very important uh, that a lot of people see protests in U.S. as a sign of weakness of America, of American society. And I disagree, obviously. I mean, a lot of people see it's not a strength of society. What do you mean it's not a strength when people can, can sense unfairness and an injustice and come up to the streets and deliver their message in the most direct way. Uh, and they are hopeful that they can actually lead this to a certain uh, sizable, palpable change. You know, uh, it sounds strange in Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, which lives through Maidan. Uh, is this kind of uh, mood, this kind of sentiment that this is, protest is bad, it's a sign of weakness, is betraying legacy of Maidan. But that's how it is. And a lot of people in Ukraine never were big fans of Maidan, uh, including the current government, which is actually not quite sure uh, about uh, the fact that uh, uh, they can be, you know, proud of Maidan, and that uh, generates a lot of anger on the pro-Maidan uh, side of conversation here in Ukraine. So what we have here often is a very rigid dichotomy that's uh, order versus anarchy, and there's like nothing in between, and there are so many different shades in between. You know, you can have this total order in the libertarian society, and you can have this total anarchy, but there are many, many other options in between, and then the uh, people tend to disregard the question like, is this order fair? You know, is it uh, just? It just becomes a secondary question, unfortunately, here often. And also, I suppose it reflects on a certain appetite for the iron fist that uh, always was present here in societies in post-Soviet space in Russia, Ukraine, and other places. And then, of course, uh, a lot of people are just plain racist. I mean, clearly, you know, and uh, by racist, again, with racism, you have many shades, you have many times. Not everyone who is racist is a white supremacist. You know, there are many other people who are not, but they are racist uh, uh, nevertheless. You know, and as often you talk to someone and say, you know, believe me, I'm not a racist. And then the person proceeds with his or her view on the issue, and you immediately see 100% totally racist. You know, so a lot of people, I mean, probably don't understand uh, themselves or don't know the criteria or trying to fool themselves, but that's not, that's how it is. And through that prism, they're seeing protest process in the US. And uh, yes, uh, there are many people who are very racist, who think that, uh, you know, a lot of blacks are lazy, you know, that many of them criminals and so on, and uh, a more general issue. What are the blacks in the US are not happy about? They sh they're fine. What else they want? You know, that's really a, a little bit uh, resembling the, what uh, Slava said already, the view, the view of America as a perfect, you know, as an idyllic uh, kind of situation, living paradise, nothing is ever wrong. Idealization of America. That's interesting because for years, coming from me, actually, for years I've been fighting uh, against those uh, negative uh, stereotypes and cliches about America. But this time around, I think uh, I see the 
the poisonous effect of idealization of America, which is also a problem, you know, because it seems, some things are wrong in America and could be better, obviously, and it could be improvement. A lot of people tend not to understand that. Uh, on the racism issue, also, uh, I think a lot of this racism here goes back to the Soviet times. You know, yes, of course, the Soviet propaganda spoke about, uh, uh, you know, discrimination and uh, racism in the U.S. And we were grown up or learning names like Angela Davis and others. But all this anti-racism was very instrumentalized and very, you know, it's very kind of a utilized international solidarity. They were all phony. So they didn't really, uh, you know, develop into the genuine anti-racist feelings in the society. So when the Soviet Union broke up, you know, you have this racist societies. Uh, on the surface, so it's not a new phenomenon. It's it's not generated by the fact that the Soviet Union is not there anymore. It was always there, developed to a certain extent in the post-Soviet space. There is also an interesting thing in case of Ukraine, for sure, that there is certain echo chamber between the diaspora from former Soviet Union in U.S. and people here in former Soviet Union. Uh, they reinforce each other, confirm stereotypes. Uh, oftentimes, people write, uh, "I live here in the U.S. many times, and blacks are fine. I don't know what they want. Uh, we are tired of this protest." And believe me, looting is, is, is so terrible. And, uh, you know, people here in the post Soviet space say, oh, see, this person lives there. So that's his position. That's we're not imagining things. Uh, no surprise that many of those people enthusiastically embraced Trumpism back in 16, and they'll probably do the same now in 2020. Uh, also, most finally, I mean, a bunch of points here in the, in the, in the final part of my uh, presentation here, so I can talk. For a long time about this, but we're limited by the format. Is a lot of people still also don't understand what's what's going on in the US. Uh, one thing is a lot of people think that uh, uh, protests have been organized by political forces, by political party Democrats. Uh, they are paid for. Uh, you know, this is also, of course, resembling a little bit and reverberating with the discussions we have here, definitely in Ukraine since Maidan, even the first Maidan. You know, some people think it's a grassroots movement, and I think it was a grassroots movement in both cases. Others say, no, 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 they only go there in the street in the square, you know, because they're paid uh, for. And the same, uh, the same kind of a, uh, uh, accusation has been now repeated against Belarus, even in Belarus, where you have hundreds of thousands of people in the streets protesting, and yet uh, you hear voices here and there that these people are paid to be there in the streets. So that's, well, that's interesting, you know, there's a politicization of the protest. It's bigger than one party, it's bigger than one ideology. And uh, often uh, the, there is a, this uh, term Bolshevism, Bolshevism in the streets of America. I don't know where it's coming from, but a lot of people are not happy here, definitely in Ukraine and other places, uh, you know, about, about uh, people uh, taking direct demo democracy, uh, you know, tools in their own hands, which happened here in Ukraine. So why not happy about this happening in the US? Uh, on Floyd, on George Floyd, a lot of people don't understand that, that it's not really about George Floyd. It's not just about jo George Floyd. There were many George Floyds before George Floyd, and, the, and there are people, unfortunately, since George Floyd shooting, killing. Uh, uh, after, you know, as we've seen in the recent weeks and months. So uh, that's why a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, how come the death of this imperfect man, you know, uh, not angelic, not a state, not, not a saint, how come it became, a, you know, a tipping point? It was a tipping point, but people don't understand that. They're trying to tarnish him, and by tarnishing him, they're trying to tarnish a movement. You know, the movement generated by the death of this imperfect man you know, it couldn't be a good movement, a movement for good. Why would? Why are they also alarmed about the death of this particular man? There are other videos and trolls and the black Israelites, for instance, and those videos are everywhere, you know, about what black uh, Israelites are doing and people, you know, washing hands and kissing boots and stuff like that. And every time you say, look, it's a very small number of people in the US, including whites who take part in, in this uh, events or uh, performances, I would say. Uh, people say, no, they could not, it would be true. I'm seeing videos all over, so it must be happening on every corner of America that they force people. Same thing with kneeling. People definitely dramatically misinterpret kneeling. You know, they see it uh, universally as an act of humiliation, while in, in fact, in real life, it's an act of humility. And that's, again, people here fail to see that. No one is putting a gun uh, to the heads of the people for them to kneel. Uh, usually, it's a, some manifestation of position of a person, even if that a police officer. For some reason, is doing that kneeling, you know. But people don't know that uh, about the Black Lives Matter uh, deliberate misunderstanding what Black Lives Matter is, and people come up with this uh, response: uh, All lives matter. Of course, they are. But let Black Lives Matter doesn't mean Black Lives only matter. <laughs> you know, it actually means Black Lives Matter should matter too, as well. Should matter as well. And that's so. There is a lot of misreading here. There's mixing with Antifa. There is understanding about Black Lives Matter as some kind of monolithic huge party hierarchical, centralized, 
you know, with all chapters working closely together. It's actually a huge mosaic of people and chapters and organizations working together in the movement. But the, the people here somehow think it's a new communist party. It's a, it's a new uh, super leftist movement and party, which is a danger to American democracy. And most finally, most finally, is there is a lot of uh, false dichotomy comparing BLM with uh, Dr. King. Uh, people are saying, oh, we are all fine with uh, nonviolent movement and look what uh, Dr. King did and we all respect him and so on, even though many people are saying that in, in real life they don't. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they, 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 they just remember that uh, King, Dr. King was criticizing uh, looting and rights, obviously, as a self-defeating and destructive thing, but also he said, of course, uh, that this is a language of the unheard. You know, if people just dem demonstrate peacefully all the time and they do it again and again and again, but there's nothing that's changing and they're not hurt, you know, there is nothing else for them to, look, to, to do but to do rioting. So a lot of times people think, uh, I'm trying to do that as well uh, here for Ukrainian audience, uh, explain where the riots is coming from. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to justify it. I'm not trying to condone it uh, or support it or, or something like endorse it. But at the same time, I'm trying to explain where the, where the rioting is coming from. It's, it's desperation. It's anger, you know, it's complete alienation, you know, and that's at the same time, that's something that often is not heard here in this uh, society. And that's unfortunate because part of that on hearing, not hearing or lack of sympathy is happening with uh, nationalistic and conservative viewpoints, but also like uh, Slava already said, happening here, here in Ukraine as well, with a lot of liberal people here who completely misread what's happening in America. And that's why on this misread, notion and understanding they base their own positions and that's why unfortunately we're not getting a lot of solidarity for this uh, racial protest movement